Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter, Hosanna. Jesus is risen. Our dearest friend who is dead is alive. He has been completely transformed and everything is different because resurrection changes everything. So on Jesus' first day out of the tomb, let's celebrate, for we were created for celebration, and for this celebration in particular. This celebration, which was foretold by prophets and awaited by God's people for centuries. The prophet Isaiah was only one of the prophets who talked about this day, and he wrote, on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And we celebrate on this Easter day, the fulfillment of that and hundreds of other prophecies in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who destroyed the power of death and now invites all people to come and celebrate with him in the endless banquet of the kingdom of God. So much of, of Jesus' teaching of God's kingdom was told in parables about parties and feasts. And he apparently enjoyed the kingdom feast so much in his earthly life that his detractors called him a drunk and a glutton. Jesus' entire ministry was a movable feast. He went from table to table, bringing the joy and freedom of heaven with him, inviting all and everyone to join him in celebrating before time, the eternal feast table that would be set very, very soon. And that banquet began on earth as it is in heaven on that first Easter morning, the day everything changed because every day since that day is Easter. Every day from today into eternity is Easter. So this morning, we no longer celebrate before time because Jesus is alive now. And we get to celebrate with him in real time. This joyous reality is what Paul celebrated with the Corinthian church. He said, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And when did that happen? It happened that first Easter morning. Then the saying that is written by Isaiah will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? We have so much to celebrate this morning because resurrection changes everything. Everything changed for Jesus in that resurrection. Yet, everything remained pretty much the same for the disciples. He was completely transformed, but they were not yet transformed. Mm. That was still all in the future for them. On this day, on that day, they were just trying to wrap their heads around the rumors and stories that he had somehow come back to life. They certainly did not know anything of the last 1,500 years of theology or even what Jesus would share with them over the coming 40 days. They had no clue in that moment that the resurrection had anything to do with them. Mm -hmm. They were simply stunned silly, <laughs> trying to make sense of it all. Yeah. And the world they were living in on that first Easter morning hadn't changed either. Mm -hmm. The markets opened as usual. The laundry still needed to be done. The streets hummed with the sounds of people doing their usual stuff. Those people didn't know that anything unusual had happened in those early dawn hours. The pilgrims who had flooded into Jerusalem for the Passover were headed home now, now that the Sabbath was over. And many of them had probably witnessed Jesus' condemnation and his crucifixion. Some were no doubt talking about him. But none of them had any inkling that the one that they saw dead on a cross on Friday was now alive and free in the world. Even as they packed their donkeys and started walking down the road out of Jerusalem. So, if you on that first day of resurrection got anything out of it, what was the point of Easter anyway? Well, of course, there is a point. And this is the point, that Jesus is alive. Yes. 
their dearest friend, our dearest friend, who was dead, has been completely transformed. And you know what? The prophecy of Isaiah was true. On this mountain, the Lord has now prepared a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wines and the uh, best meats and the finest of wines, which were his own broken body, his own spilled blood. And on this mountain, he has destroyed the shroud that enfolds all people, the sheep that covers all nations. He has swallowed up death forever. This is the point of Easter. Jesus is alive. And by the way, he is overjoyed about that. Yes, and his father is jo overjoyed about that too. Can't you just feel the father's excitement? And hear the father's response as the stone was rolled away from Jesus' tomb? They can hear it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. That's what Jesus said in his parable about the prodigal son's return and i believe that the first to celebrate on that first easter morning were the trinity let us celebrate yes i think the trinity father son and spirit were the first to join together and because they were joined together again in their divine dance of oneness the all of this is beyond our human ability really to comprehend and yet Resurrection does change everything. And if you'll bear with us for a moment, resurrection even changes God. Yes. Don't panic. <laughs> <laughs> the Jesus' resurrection, it did not change the essence of God. It did not change the character of God. Both are unchanging. The same yesterday, today, and forever. However, the resurrection did change the experience of God. Just think about it. Invisible, immortal God had never been human before. But in Jesus, God took on our humanity and experienced our limitations and our needs and our mortality. Again, this is one of the, the great mysteries of Christianity. It was affirmed as truth in the fourth century that Jesus is fully divine and fully human that one of the three members of the Trinity became human. And through his life, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, the whole Trinity experienced something new. And if God wanted us to understand it, Jesus would have explained it to us, wouldn't he? But he didn't give us an explanation. What Jesus did give us was a beautiful story, the story of the prodigal father that offers us a glimpse into the joy that God must have experienced when his resurrected son walked out of that tomb alive. See, that was not a moment for theological charts or scientific explanations. The only possible response in that moment is unbounded, overflowing joy and celebration in the Trinity. And no doubt, a lot of angels were cheering and singing around them too. Yeah, and at the center of all of this celebration is Christ. So think for a moment. You know, you may know that story, but mm -hmm. the prodigal thought, prodigal by the way that means wasteful or extravagant. So the father is also extravagant here and prodigal. What was the first thing that prodigal father did in Jesus' parable? When he got his son back alive, when he's hugging him like that, now, think about how our world does it. Did he prepare a press release? <laughs> Did he deliver a sermon? Because this is a theological moment. Did he just send him off to the fields to get to work? Time to get to work, boy. No, the first thing he did instinctively, joyfully, was to throw a party. And he invited everyone to celebrate with him. Look, he said, my son is alive and has come back home. Celebrate with me. And his son was the center of the celebration which, as we know, provoked a little jealousy on the part of the brother. See, this was true on that first Easter as well. Jesus is alive, and he's full of joy. And what he and the Father want more than anything in that moment is for everyone to celebrate with him. Now, we're not just guessing at this. We're not just making this up. How do we know this? Because he said it himself. 
the last time he sat down at a table with his disciples, his friends, he told them, he said, you will weep and be overcome with grief over what happens to me. But know this, your sadness will turn into joy when you see me again. And then he gives an example that you may not expect a man to give. Just as a woman giving birth experiences intense labor pains in delivering her baby, yet after the child is born, she quickly forgets what she went through because of the overwhelming joy of knowing that a new baby has been born into the world and that it's her baby. So will you also pass for a time of intense sorrow when I'm taken from you, but you will see me again. And what's going to happen in that moment? And then your hearts will burst with joy with no one able, being able to take it away from you. What's he talking about here? You know, he's talking about Easter. <laughs> There's only one response to Easter. Hearts bursting with joy for him. Yep. He wants his friends to celebrate with him. He invites us to share in his joy. In the Trinity's joy. But it gets even better than that. Because that's not all those first confused, joyful encounters with the risen. Uh, in his first uh, confused, joyful encounters with the risen Christ, his friends are also getting a glimpse of a truth that will become more and more evident as time went on. That the resurrection not only changes everything, but it redeems everything as well. Yes, um beginning with Jesus' friends. See, resurrection redeemed their failure to keep company with him um, in the night of his arrest. You remember what happened on Friday night after the Passover meal, what we call the Last Supper. Jesus led his friends to the Mount of Olives to a garden where he often prayed. Only this time, Jesus was in anguish, deeply grieved even to death as he put it. He was grieved by what had been and was yet about to happen. Please stay and pray with me, he asked a few of them, and then went about a, th a stone's throw away and prayed his heart out for an hour, only to return to find his friend sleeping. Yes, it was late. They were full from the meal. They were tired, but they were also uninvolved. They were disconnected from their friend's agony. So he woke them and, and he pleaded with them to be with him. He wanted the comfort of their company. Yeah, sure, Jesus. And he went off to pray again, but when he returned an hour later, they were asleep again. And it happened again a third time. And that time, they were awakened to see armed guards there in the garden to arrest Jesus and their nightmare began. See, for three hours that night, Jesus' friends abandoned him. Yet after his resurrection, Jesus came alongside a couple of other disciples who were on their way home from Jerusalem to Emmaus. They didn't recognize Jesus when he asked them what they were talking about. They were thinking he was probably he's just another pilgrim like them. So they began to tell him about what had happened over the weekend. That Jesus, the teacher, the rabbi, was crucified on Friday. And yet, they'd heard reports that he had risen from the dead just that morning. Well, then the stranger told them the story from the scripture of who Jesus was and why it had happened the way that it did. They were amazed. Their hearts were warm. They wanted to hear more. See, they wanted to keep company with this man. So when they got to Emmaus, they invited him to join them for supper. He did. And then finally, they realized who they'd been, comp been keeping company with. Tony, you were keeping company with Jesus and Emmaus recently too, weren't you? Yes, indeed, actually. I spent two weeks last summer, as many of you know, in Israel in what turned out to be Emmaus, digging in the dirt. <laughs> um, but also I was there primarily on spiritual pilgrimage. And I got the chance to go to Jerusalem several times while I was there. It's not that far away. And if I were walking it, and I am a bit of a walker, 
I guess it would take about three hours in those days to travel by foot from Jerusalem to Emmaus. How cool is this? See, it appears that Jesus joy-filled a three-hour walk to Emmaus with some friends who wanted to be with him and, and begged him to stay with them. Just think that he just may have been redeeming those painful three hours he'd spent in the garden just a few days before. Those three hours with his tired friends who simply couldn't yet understand the whole story unfolding before them. Isn't that awesome? We never noticed that before. And here's another one, and I want to get the, my face off the screen. Uh, the resurrection of Jesus also redeemed the last meal that he and his friends had had together. It had been on the previous Thursday evening, and it was the feast of the Passover. And they had gathered in an upper room somewhere in Jerusalem to do what Jews still do, to deliver, um, to remember the deliverance of their ancestors from slavery in Egypt. Families would gather and they would celebrate this feast together. So these, these folks, they were friends, becoming a family. So Jesus played a couple roles there that night. He played the part of a servant, and, and he washed their feet to their surprise and even some objections. But then when he sat down at the table, he played the part of the head of the family who presided over this very symbolic meal. It had been a sad event that evening because Jesus had used the symbols of the meal to predict and to describe his death. Mm -hmm. He had broken the press of her bread like normal, but instead of pointing backward toward Exodus, this time he pointed forward to the next day to his body about to be broken. Mm -hmm. He then served the Passover wine. But instead of drawing attention to the blood of lambs on Israelite doorposts, as, as would have been typical, he talked about his own blood about to be shed for them. It was somber and it was sober. The meal was also a bit rudely interrupted by Judas who left early to go betray Jesus. Yeah. And Jesus knew exactly what he was up to. It was a deeply meaningful meal, linking together the past and the present and the future. But it was sad. It was a funeral meal in advance. It was a preparation for his death. Yeah. It's fascinating then, isn't it, that the disciples in Emmaus recognized Jesus immediately when he sat down for dinner with them and he broke the bread. That's when their eyes were open to see him as he truly was. It's Jesus. We didn't recognize him. He's been here with us for these past three hours. Why then? Because even in the sadness of the previous meal, he had assured them that no matter else, what else would happen to them and to him, they would eat together someday. He said, I tell you, I will never again drink of this fruit of the vine, what I have here in this cup, until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And now here he was, yes. drinking it new with them in entirely new circumstances. Yes. And what had been a meal of sorrow on Thursday was now a meal of celebration because he wasn't dead, he was alive. Yep. And because of his resurrection, the kingdom of his father had come to them in fullness. He had redeemed that meal because he had redeemed their grief. Wow, so much happening in, such a sh in one day. And the resurrection, also, the resurrection of Jesus redeemed his, the, the betrayals and the hesitations, the fears, the sorrows of his friends. In the 40 days following the resurrection, Jesus would engage his disciples again and again. He just kept popping in and out helping them to understand what had happened, to help them to begin to just grasp some of the implications of what this meant for the future. But even in just the first few days, they could see that things were different. Jesus engaged Peter at the Sea of Galilee, and this disciple who did not want Jesus to wash his feet at the Last Supper, he jumped into the water completely, and he swam to shore to be with his friend Jesus. And Jesus transformed the bitter regret of Peter's denials 
into affirmation, an affirmation of love. Other disciples that had abandoned Jesus as he hung dying on the cross experienced their relationships with Jesus renewed as well. Then the two Marys who went um, in grief to the tomb that first Sunday morning found their fear transformed into awe. They left the tomb confused and then right on the road, Jesus appeared to them alive and they fell down and worshiped him. Thomas, who quite reasonably wanted to see Jesus alive with his own eyes. I have to say, I probably would have said the same thing. Well, when he did see it, he fell to his knees in worship. Is there any better response to the resurrection than that? Awe and astonishment, gratitude and delight, instinctive reverence, kneeling in faith before a reality beyond reason, with exclamations of praise and shouts of joy. Mm. I think really that's all we really could do if we'd been there then. And what about now? <laughs> my Lord and my God. Think about it, right, Tony? What else can we do? Yeah. My Lord and my God. Right. And so resurrection does indeed change and redeem everything. It changed to Jesus. It changed the Trinity, and it does change us. And, and we'll talk more about that next week, but for today and for this coming week, why don't we simply just keep our focus on him and give Jesus what he wants, friends who will celebrate with him with exceeding joy that he is alive because no tomb can hold him. And that this miracle did and does happen for all who will open their eyes to see him standing there, smiling in joy before them, before every one of us. And so we invite you to celebrate Jesus' resurrection today in at least two ways. First, let's celebrate communion together. Now, not the sad communion of Monday, Thursday. That's, that's appropriate then. But it's Easter now. So let's join the disciples in Emmaus and eat and drink his resurrection. As his friends in this generation, let's celebrate that he is alive, that the kingdom of God is indeed among us, that resurrection does indeed change and redeems everything. Now, this, this you might be saying, how are we going to do this? This is a little strange. Well, we don't have to be in the same room to do this, although it's wonderful when we can be. We miss you today on Easter Sunday of all days. We don't even have to eat the same bread and drink from the same cup. Although, again, it's wonderful when we can do that. Those things are not the point of it. They're the symbols. They're not the core. By the way, we don't even have to have a particular kind of bread or drink. So I invite you to find something that you have available wherever you are. Something that would just simply represent what Jesus had in front of him. Whether it's a slice of bread, a hamburger roll, a saltine, whatever. Mm -hmm. And find something to drink. Maybe it's wine or grape juice. Maybe it's even Diet Pepsi. <laughs> Pause this recording if you need to get, uh, you know, need to for a while to gather uh, that for yourself and for anybody else in your household who may be joining you for this. The Greek word for this celebration is Eucharist, which means literally good grace. Mm -hmm. It's often translated as Thanksgiving. Some churches still use that word for what we, we call communion. It's the good grace of God that raised Jesus from the dead. And it's the good grace of God that allows this resurrection to change everything. So that's what we're going to do in this communion service today on Resurrection Day. We're going to celebrate the good grace of God by sharing in the Lord's Supper and the Lord's Feast yes. together right now. Yeah. Well... Please take your bread in your hand as we pause to remember in gratitude what this bread represents. Both the bruised and broken body of Jesus freely given for us all on the cross and the resurrected body of Jesus raised in new and eternal life, freely given to all who will come to him in love. We do this in remembrance of him. Take and eat.
And now, please take the cup. As we pause to remember in gratitude what this cup represents, both the shed blood of Jesus freely flowing to wash us clean, and the wounds still visible in Jesus' resurrected body, the pain and suffering transformed in trophies of grace, in love and for love. Do this in remembrance of him. Now take and drink. <laughs> It's good to be with you, even if it, as Tony said earlier, if it's, even if it's not in the same room, we are connected as one, one spirit, one Lord, one resurrection, and one hope. And uh, it's in that hope that we pray. And um, we just give you a blessing as we bless the Lord. Blessed are you, Lord God of our salvation. To you be praise and glory forever. As once you ransomed your people from Egypt and led them to freedom in the promised land. So now you have delivered us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your risen son. May we, the first fruits of your new creation, Rejoice in this new day you have made and praise you for your mighty acts. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, what did Mary and Mary, there were two Marys that day, and Thomas do upon encountering the risen Christ Joanne told us earlier? Scripture says they instinctively reacted by stopping in their tracks to worship him. Let's do the same. This is our second way to celebrate this resurrection. I invite you to continue this service now by going back to the website and, 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 and to the worship video that Sean and the worship team have prepared for us. And enjoy that. Do that to, to remember and to give thanks and to rejoice. And by the way, do it out loud in your home if possible. <laughs> Let's celebrate that our friend Jesus has risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. <laughs>